Good afternoon to you all. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the Digital Policy Group here at the Institute of International and European Relations. You're all very welcome. I'm delighted to see that we have three audiences today. This is a hybrid event to our audience here in North Great Georgia Suite. You're all very welcome. Great to see you in person again. We have an audience on Zoom um, and also streaming on YouTube. So we're very pleased to have you all here and you're very welcome. We have a great event today, very lively, and I'm looking forward to a good discussion and debate on the issues that are raised by our speakers. Um, it's As you know, it's on safeguarding media pluralism and independence in the digital age, Ireland in context. I'm delighted now to welcome our distinguished guests, um, Dr. Anna Harald, head of the audio and media policy unit in GD Connect in the European Commission is on our right, is with us from Brussels. You're very welcome, Anna. We look forward to your presentation. And beside uh, Anna is Renata Schroeder, who's director of the European Federation of Journalists. Uh, Renata, you're very welcome. I hope the weather is as good in Brussels as it is in Ireland. It's absolutely splitting the waves here, um, very unusual for Ireland, as you know. And here in Dublin, we have uh, Dr. Eileen Cullity, who's assistant professor in the School of Communications in Dublin City University. She's deputy director of the Institute of Media Democracy and Society. And sitting beside Eileen is Celine Cray, commissioner at the Commission of Mon, and the Media Commission. So you're all very welcome. And I really appreciate very much you taking the time to be with us today. Um, it's, it's great to have you here in person, but also online. Now, each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will go to you, the audience, uh, for questions and answers. Those of you who are here in the IIEA, if you can put up your hands, I um, promise we won't force you to, but if you could put up your hands for either Q for a question or comments, and obviously those online can use the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I'd very much appreciate if you give your name and affiliation when you're asking a question or comments. That would be really very helpful. Now, today's web webinar is longer than usual. It's an hour and a half, just to let you know that. But what is usual, it's on uh, the record, both the presentations and the Q&A. And if you'd like to join our discussion on Twitter, using the handle at IIEA, we'd be very pleased. Now, today's event is organized in collaboration with the Economic Regulators Network, ERN, a cross-sectional group of economic regulators in Ireland. The ERN is composed of a range of commissions, the Commission of Communication Regulation, the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, the Commission for Regulation of Utilities, Commission Naman, the Central Bank of Ireland, the National Transport Authority, and the Commission uh, for Aviation Regulation. As we were talking earlier today, and I'm sure if you're listening to radio and, and looking at other media, our webinar today is very timely. There's been a lot of discussion and recent reports on the topic of our webinar. And yesterday, you might have seen the Commission Amon launch their report, a digital news report, Ireland 2023, um, which was published. And research was carried out by Reuters Institute in the study of journalism in Oxford University. And the Irish report was completed by DCU's Institute of Future Media Democracy and Society. That's a very interesting report. It covers worldwide national and international uh, trends on online news audience, how audience, online audience access news, the whole issue about trust in news and sources, and also the issue of paying for news. It's the largest ongoing study of news consumption in the world, so it's well worth looking at. Our next expert panel today will explore how media pluralism and independence can be maintained in the context of digital transformation and against the background of deteriorating media freedom across Europe. The European Media Freedom Act, as you know, is a proposal for a European regulation with the fundamental object to strengthen media, 
independence and media pluralism. It comes with both rights and duties for a, a whole range of media players. Our panel will ass assess, ass assess the <clears throat> implementation of the EMFA for uh, digitalization of media in both Ireland and Europe, and also consider how the EFMA may interact with other digital policies. And those of you who are here will know there's a lot of digital policies, a lot of regulations, and that really you know, poses a big challenge. Our guest speaker and our first speaker is Dr. Anna Harald. Anna, you're very welcome again. Anna, as I've said, is head of the Audiovisual and Media Policy Unit at DG Connect. Anna has worked in the European Commission since 2003, dealing with the media, audiovisual, telecommunications policy, as well as competition law. She's previously served as a member of the Cabinet for the Digital Economy um, and Society Commissioner, Gunter Ottener. And prior to that, she was with Roberto Viola with, in DG Connect. She has published widely on media, law and policy, international law and competition law. Anna, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me and see me well. Uh, it's indeed equally hot in Brussels, very unusual, uh, uh, which makes our work on the European Media Freedom Act <laughs> even more complicated, <laughs> if you want, because as you might know, we are now um, in a very par particular phase and delicate phase uh, for the adoption of this uh, uh, crucial legislation for the uh, from the point of view of the European Commission, the Media Freedom Act that you have already introduced, and I thank you for that, um, because the member states uh, hopefully uh, next week uh, will agree on a, a common uh, mandate to start negotiations uh, with the other co-legislators with the European Parliament, hopefully in the autumn. Um, it's, uh, as I said, uh, a great pleasure. And also it's extremely interesting that you put the today's discussions in the context of the digital transformation, which uh, is uh, an angle that uh, sometimes I have the impression is uh, a little bit overlooked in our Brussels discussions uh, when we look at the European Media Freedom Act. Uh, of course, it is beyond any doubt, and you have said it, that uh, the um, genesis or uh, the backdrop of the uh, adoption of the proposal in the Commission is, of course, the situation, the overall situation, the deteriorating situation in terms of media freedom across the European Union. And we know that uh, there are significant differences between the member states. Uh, this is shown, of course, uh, this has been uh, pointed out um, by, um, for example, Reporters Without Borders um, already for many years. So we have seen this uh, unfortunate backsliding you know, the, in this kind of uh, leading role uh, <clears throat> of Europe as the bastion of media freedom, if you want. And the European Commission, as you know, has also started looking at, at these issues more closely as part of its, of its rule of law um, uh, reports, uh, where media freedom, media pluralism, media freedom is one of the three pillars that are being looked at in terms of the situation uh, across the member states. Um, but, and this is why I think that this discussion is particularly timely, when we have started discussing about this new piece of legislation um, within the Commission, uh, we uh, really uh, looked at it uh, precisely from the perspective that you are taking uh, in today's debate. Uh, is there anything, is there anything that we could still do uh, for the European media sector that is needed in order to better face the digital transformation. Because I think that was a little bit the missing puzzle in uh, all the regulatory efforts that we have already 
um, undertaking before with the revision of the audiovisual media rules, uh, with the um, Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. Are we, we have asked ourselves, have we been paying enough attention to media pluralism in the digital context? And the digital aspects of MFA, uh, if you want, you know, it's it's been it's been a, a bit of a common thread. If you look at the recitals, uh, I think it's very it's very visible that the whole thinking <clears throat> about <clears throat> the primary objectives of these legislations, which are obviously to 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 protect first and foremost editorial. Uh, and in general, media independence, and of course, uh, by that also pluralism in the in the in the media markets, um, have been uh, really to see um, uh, how we can also help the media and help us, uh, the um, uh, viewers, listeners, readers uh, of the news media, uh, to have the to continue to have the best possible. Um, uh, media offer uh, at our disposal when we inform ourselves. In these completely changed environments, uh, of course, there has been, you know, so much discussions uh, on the development, so I will, of course, not, uh, I think it's common knowledge, you know, that we are kind of uh, living in a completely transformed uh, environment in terms of access to media content. Um, uh, so the the idea and the kind of uh, common thread of the Media Freedom Act has been, can we do more in order to ensure this media independence and media pluralism for European citizens? Um, so um, I think that it's, it's useful maybe a bit zoom in on those provisions that are precisely trying to um, respond to these challenges in the digital environment, uh, while of course not forgetting about you know the, the the primary goals. I'm pretty sure that Renate, when she will be talking, you know, she will refer, let's say, to the core of EMFA if you want, which is of course about protecting editorial independence uh, of uh, the media, uh, protecting journalists. Uh, protecting specific media that are particularly close to the state, like public service media, and also avoiding uh, um, favoritism, for example, as regards uh, the allocation of state advertising. So of course, this is the core, if you want, of, of the Media Freedom Act. But since you have chosen this digital topic, I would like to zoom in a little bit on the uh, more digital aspects of this new piece of legislation. And I think I would quote probably the three main provisions um, uh, um, uh, that probably will not be uh, a, su a surprise because these belong also to those that are mostly discussed and mo most uh, hotly debated now in Brussels. The first, uh, obviously, uh, will be the additional guarantees that we try to provide to reputable professional media uh, in their relationships to the very large online platforms, um, uh, in particular, where the content coming from such professional, reputable media might be uh, blocked, removed, uh, uh, as uh, potentially incompliant with the terms and conditions of platforms. Um, there has been, of course, a lot of debate on this topic already uh, previously in the context of the uh, adoption of the Digital Services Act. The reason why we have come back um, to this topic in the Media Freedom Act is because we uh, have, of course, we have observed and we have uh, discussed this with the co-legislators at the time of the DSA adoption, and it was the decision of the co-legislators not to include any provisions in this respect, but the reason why we thought that now the situation has been different and that we cannot, how should I put it, leave the European Union without answers on this important issue from the point of view of access um, of citizens to uh, professional media content online is that precisely um, uh, the, the whole uh, framework that we are trying to create, that we are trying to put in place, with 
um, guaranteeing the editorial independence of media would allow us um, now also to uh, make sure that there are enough guarantees um, that the content coming from such media will genuinely be produced in line with, um, with the professional standards, the journalistic standards we so much cherish here in Europe. Um, so that is a bit maybe why we have come back to this important topic. And in a way, our thinking is that, um, of course, we would like these uh, new digital actors that have become so important uh, in like, some sort of gateways to content for, for all of us in today's consumption of, of, of media. Of course, we would like them. And this is, was the primary and, and it remains the primary objective of the legislation that has been put in place with the Digital Services Act to uh, uh, to identify and address uh, all the systemic risks that you know that the dissemination of content online might pose. Uh, so uh, of course we want to continue um, uh, the platforms to act diligently or start acting even more diligently uh, than maybe uh, they have uh, done uh, so far. But at the same time, what we care incredibly about, uh, I think, here in this part of the world is that um, media freedom, in a way, should be the default. And it should not be necessarily the private companies that should decide um, uh, which content uh, is, uh, how should I put it, not to their liking, uh, um, uh, um, if it's not compliant with the terms and conditions. So that has been a bit the background of this, uh, of this provision that has been hotly debated, uh, and it will continue to be hotly debated, of course, um, uh, between the stakeholders and, of course, uh, by the co-legislators. I think what is extremely useful to note is that the whole discussion, I have, I have, as we have seen it now evolving, um, I think gradually embraced, I think what was the logic that I was trying to explain of the commission's proposal. There is of course a lot of discussion on this, on the, on the, you know, who can qualify for this privileged treatment by the platforms in terms of uh, professional media. And that in a way goes precisely, you know, in the direction of the commission's proposal. So we are very happy to see these discussions and, and the evolution maybe to trying to tighten up even more uh, the safeguards that, uh, that we have foreseen. Uh, and of course, there is an ongoing discussion also on the scope of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the actual privileges, where I think that from the commission's perspective will be extremely important that we sort of try to strike the right balance between these efforts that I have been mentioning by platforms and obligations under the DSA, specifically and in particular as regards disinformation, because of course we are talking here only about potentially harmful content. This is totally without prejudice to, of course, anything that might um, qualify as illegal content. Uh, so it will be very important that we strike the right balance and, and, and make sure that these two pieces of legislation that have very different objectives if you want, but can work harmoniously together. Uh, there are two other provisions that I want to mention that are discussed maybe a little bit less, but uh, for us uh, have been a very important part of the mix. Uh, one uh, is what you can find in article 19 of our proposal, uh, which is uh, the right of customization of the, in our proposal, audiovisual media offer. Um, uh, and, and then there is also an important provision on audience measurement that might seem extremely technical, but it's also uh, incredibly important in our view um, to make sure um, um, uh, that we are preserving the right conditions of access to content on the one hand, but also of production of high quality content and diverse content for um, uh, uh, for the benefit of all of us. So um, as regards the customization of the media offer, um, um, this has been an attempt from our side to counteract yet another trend, 
uh, that has become uh, very visible in the way that the offers, media offers, are being presented to us. Uh, we all, of course, are increasing accessing our content via the um, uh, either, uh, um, you know, all the sort of interfaces, uh, either on our smart TVs or other devices. Um, and uh, uh, it is uh, very easily, it is it's much more, it is, <laughs> it is much easier uh, for us to be locked, if you want, uh, into and also directed or nudged into consuming certain types of content as opposed to other as it uh, used to be uh, before. In a way, there is a little bit of a paradox, if you want, uh, that while this seems to be that the, you know, the access opportunities to content, of course, have uh, uh, exponentially cre increased with the digital revolution, but we are kind of experiencing new bottlenecks without often even realizing that this is the case. And this is what uh, our provision you know, tries to at least partially address uh, by mandating um, uh, for manufacturers um, and producers of, uh, of all these interfaces and devices to uh, make possible for us, for the users, uh, to freely choose the, the configuration of the content that appears, if you want, on the home screen when we open uh, whatever uh, uh, device we are uh, accessing our content from. Uh, so that is probably, you know, an aspect that has been discussed a little bit less, but it, I think in the, uh, uh, in the future we will hear even more about this. And, it really boils down to this debate about whether we, you know, want uh, to have, you know, the right margin of, of, of appreciation and on maneuver when we are deciding uh, what to watch, listen or read, uh, as opposed uh, to what is being decided by the commercial agreements between uh, those that provide us. Uh, um, with accent, access to content. Um, and last but not least, uh, this provision on audience measurement uh, um, is also extremely important. I mean, audience measurement has been, you know, uh, hasn't been a particularly sexy topic in media regulation so far, because the industry has, uh, if you want, self-regulated itself uh, very successfully. Um, it has changed in the online environment because of this development of the proprietary uh, methods of measuring audience uh, that you know can easily be manipulated uh, and can have an enormous impact on uh, the way uh, media content providers uh, plan even their content production. Um, and not to speak that, of course, it can have uh, an impact on their advertising revenues as such. And by the way, uh, as you know very well, audience measurement is also uh, something which is extremely important for actually knowing the level of media pluralism in the market. So, of course, if we uh, allow, um, if you want, developments in, in a direction uh, whereby you know it is controlled again by very powerful players in the market without much transparency, it might become increasingly difficult for us to assess uh, what we would think from the public policy perspective as an appropriate level of pluralism in the market. This is why we have introduced the requirements for audience measurement transparency in the Media Freedom Act. And we sincerely hope that uh, once in place, these new requirements will lead um, uh, to, um, let, let's say, will, will direct the market into a direction that in the end will be much more conducive to, um, much more open, much more conducive to, um, uh, for all the media players, but in particular the media uh, service providers, uh, to invest, um, uh, uh, you know, with the full, um, let's say, to make informed choices when they are investing in content. 
So I think that these were the, the, the two provisions I wanted to a little bit zoom in. I will still, if you allow me uh, two more minutes, want to uh, um, say a few words uh, uh, about um, um, another aspect that is probably less discussed, but I think equally interesting. Uh, from the perspective, uh, um, um, say from the digital perspective uh, um, uh, that you are now kind of looking at uh, on media pluralism issues today, which is the uh, provisions that we have in the proposal on cooperation between media regulators. And um, we have, I mean, if you look at the Media Freedom Act, you will see that it is a piece of legislation that, of course, and deliberately uh, stays uh, on a very much principle-based level of harmonization because of the sensitivities of the issues, of course, for the member states, um, and also sometimes difficulties in regulating media pluralism that I think everybody who has been involved in those regulatory debates know very well about. At the same time, uh, we are building a very strong institutional if you want a uh, framework uh, by trying uh, to um, draw on the experience of independent media regulators that are the only ones <laughs> I think that we have that know so much about media regula uh, regulation and in particular about media pluralism in Europe um, are independent show, should be at least independent uh, according to the uh, to the provisions under the audiovisual media services directive and uh, so of course where we also can make a difference in case there shouldn't be you know the a required level of independence in one particular case and can do two things on the one hand uh, provide with the right type of advice when things go wrong in the media market. I'm pretty sure Renata will say a few things about it. But also, and this is extremely important, look at the media regulation, also from the media pluralism perspective, let's say re from the European, from the European level. Uh, of course, we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, media regulation in Ireland, uh, and Celine knows that very well, uh, of course, it's a little bit, how should I put it, in the limelight now, no? especially as regards the new rules of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, uh, because of the country of origin principle, and the fact that many of the new online players that we are trying to regulate um, will be under the responsibility of the Irish regulator. Uh, so the this is, of course, the principle, and this is how we have imagined Europe, no? uh, on the basis of mutual trust and the fact that, of course, we can rely that if there is robust regulation in one member state, then there can be freedom uh, to provide services. At the same time, it, it is, of course, undisputed that these players that we are talking about, the video sharing platforms, or, you know, as they are now, some of them uh, will be also the very large online platforms under the DSA, are players that are so important uh, for uh, all the member states, because they provide services, of course, everywhere in Europe and beyond, uh, that I think it is unthinkable uh, to um, think of media regulation as something purely national. So there has to be a forum for discussion and, uh, and, and the more formalized framework of cooperation uh, between the media regulators in Europe. And this is what we are trying to do also with EMFA, that the regulators can talk with each other when there are issues, uh, that there is a specific mechanism um, for ensuring that these new obligations on video sharing platforms work well under the ADMSD, but also, and this is also extremely important, take common uh, approaches or, or even uh, decisions as regards maybe certain uh, third country providers that uh, distribute their content in Europe, um, uh, but do not necessarily abide by the same standards uh, uh, that uh, our media providers do. And this has been, of course, acutely felt recently in the context of the uh, Russian war in Ukraine. So I think that with that, I, I, I leave the other speakers to complement the picture, but these were the provisions I wanted 
a little bit to zoom into and I wanted only to uh, to um, uh, stress again how grateful we are to be involved in those discussions and of course how important the Irish contribution to this debate is uh, because I think of the particularly um, positive development I think in the in the Irish media market and the approaches to media pluralism that of course we would like to somehow you know now to draw upon and 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 promote with the new legislation legislation when, once it is in place thank you thank you very much Anna I think you've given a very clear overview of the European perspective and the issues and challenges that are there but you have asked a very fundamental question is there anything we can do better to address digital transformation in this area. And I think you've highlighted some of those key issues. I'm not going to summarize what you said, but I thought it was very interesting that you emphasized institutional uh, cooperation and institutional framework, and also the fundamental value of freedom of media. I think they were really key points that you've made. So thank you very much for, for your presentation. So we'll come to our second speaker, Renata Schroeder. Uh, Renata, you're very welcome again. And Renata, as you know, is the director of the European Federation of Journalists. Before joining the EMFJ, Renata worked in the UN, in, in New York, in the FAST Research Center in Berlin, and in the Frederick Ebert Foundation in Brussels. As the director of the EFJ, her work covers a wide range of activities. You're a busy lady, uh, Renata. Uh, advocacy at EU and Council of Europe level, international meetings, fact-finding media freedom missions. And she also works on a range of expert groups covering areas such as media literacy and broadcasting, the role of freelancers and digital journalism. Renata, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Just I may add that it's been almost 30 years that I've been working now for journalists, for journalist unions and associations, because unions and associations at national level are our members we are working for, and we have members in all EU and Council of Europe member states. And I think it's very important because we are, as we say, the one and only, but the main journalist federation um, yeah, representative in that sense, and also a member both of the European Trade Union Confederation, but also of the Council of Europe Steering Committee and others. And indeed, I'm very busy and partly thanks to Anna Herold and her team who has done excellent job. I think specifically this last European Commission has woken up to the challenges. I will explore a bit more on media freedom, on, on journalism and understood what is at stake. Indeed, it's not only pluralism, it's not only the right to know, it's not only the rule of law, it's not only democracy, it is European integration at large. And I think we all have a vested interest in, in working on that together. I will just in my hopefully brief um, presentation, repeat maybe a little bit more the challenges we the journalists at regional, national and local level are facing. Then come also regarding the European Media Freedom Act, uh, highlight a few other issues on, on the Media Freedom Act. Anna already referred to, to me. She knows what our most important concerns are. To finish with um, some conclusions specifically relating to enforcement mechanisms. So, um, yeah, as as you can imagine, we are fighting not only myself, but our members on all levels to, in fact, restore an enabling environment where journalism as a public good can play its fundamental role of a watchdog. And here we also appreciated that not only UNESCO saying information is a public good, but also the Commission in the EMFA has stressed the term that it is a public good and public goods need protection from all sides. Professional journalism today may be more important than ever, as it allows giving the voiceless a voice, as it engages with different audiences, reaches out when enabled, 
uh, with new forms to the young and um, to the young and in different groups with new forms, sorry, promoting social inclusion by that in particular at local level to the ever more diverging and unfortunately polarized audiences. All that, however, is possible only if the legal and financial framework enables journalists to do the work they are best at, searching the truth, researching, analyzing, going in the streets, covering wars, but also being constructive and not only work within the 24 hours news agenda people are used to and are getting very tired of. News avoidance has been a term used by media researchers, and you referred to the Reuters report, which just came out yesterday, and news avoidance among a youth is a big issue we all have to take very seriously. And we have to make sure that public interest journalism is not becoming only a niche for the few and for the rich. We need to replace what we were used as in terms of mass media. We don't have that anymore. We are going digital and we have to make sure that journalism as a public good is secured in the digital world with new and potentially dangerous players. So in recent years, as I said, we face many challenges and I'm sure you all from your national level have others to add. Maybe the most important one is the lack of a business model for independent journalism. And here we cannot only blame the monopolies, the internet platforms coming from the US, but of course they don't help. But also the increased control by politicians, including really harsh smear campaigns in Trump style, unfortunately now also in European member states. Media capture, physical attacks, precarious working conditions, attacks against protection of sources due to increased surveillance of the state are not helping. And Anna rightly said, we have very different systems within the member states. I think Ireland is one of the better, one of the best, but some of the southern, more central eastern countries face serious problems. However, we also know there is no member states without any problem. So we have to be very careful. So this digital transformation, the rise of the platforms to information monopolies at not no costs, but attention economy driven business models, often prioritizing disinformation and not only as Anna said, those by third countries, um, and the clickbait journalism, which goes in that direction, has indeed not helped the state of independent journalism today. So late, but hopefully not too late, the current European Commission has understood the challenges, as I just mentioned, and delivered quite a bit in these last years. And the latest one has been the draft of the European Media Freedom Act, which was published on uh, in September last year. I will not go into the details either on the DSA, on the DMA, but also other developments regarding SLAP, strategic lawsuits, which are also increasingly led against journalists and the audiovisual media service directive, which have all been very important and have to seen, be seen in a more holistic way. Um, so a few words on the proposal. First of all, I think it's important to say that the EFJ has welcomed the draft regulation by the European Commission, specifically also as a political symbol and knowing how difficult indeed it is to touch about media issues. As I said before, I've been working 30 years in this field. I started when we had a green paper on media concentration. It got close, but in the end it failed due to some media modules, which are called Rupert Murdoch, unfortunately it's still there, Leo Kirch and Berlusconi, who just passed away. And I'm very surprised by the media now making him a hero. For me, he was a criminal, but this is just a side sentence. <laughs> so um, yes, indeed, um, we have a proposal here. We all know it's not easy but we have to be ambitious. It's now or never. We told the commission for us, this draft is not ambitious enough, and enough 
but of course we understand there are many, many different interests to, to take care of, but our work, and that's I think why I have been terribly busy in these last seven months, has been trying to improve it, specifically on the issues which are dear to journalists and journalist freedom, which is, and I'll, I'll tell you in a nutshell, there is for once Article 4 dealing with protection of sources and protection from surveillance, spyware, Pegasus, you name it, Article 5, of course, as Anna said, very important, the independence of public service media, but also the financing of it ever more under the attack in almost all member states, I would say. And for us, Article 6, which is dealing with media transparency and editorial independence, which I have to say something fiercely attacked by not all, but many and the bigger press publisher groups who for that very reason called the Media Freedom Act an Unfreedom Act, which I think was based on disinformation because they said the commission would try to control content, which is by no means included. But this, I'm just giving this example because I show the level of distrust when it comes to any attempt or draft in this case by the European Commission to deal with media freedom issues. The level of distrust we also heard with members of the European Parliament, of national member states afraid that the Commission is taking over. And I found that particularly frustrating reading the text because I know the Commission was extremely careful not to go into this direction. But that's why we face so many challenges and I will come up with uh, maybe some ideas how to get rid of that. Um, so just in a nutshell, the most important points for us are the need to adopt a forward-looking inclusive definition of media and media service providers in line with international standards and explicitly include journalists. We believe that as it is defined now, I think it's based on the copyright directive, is not far reaching and modern enough. It should also include non-commercial media actors and, and all kinds of new forms, including journalists who are fulfilling, of course, a public function and who work within ethical lines. We always refer to the Council of Europe because the standards given there are in our view the best ones. We wanted to have an improvement regarding protection of sources uh, of journalists and deployment of any spyware to be in line specifically with Council of Europe standards, which we found the Commission proposal has not been. There are, in our view, a need for more binding, common and clear rules on transparency of media ownership to ensure meaningful transparency, which is so necessary to have more trust in journalism. We also ask for strengthening of safeguards of the independence of national regulatory authorities. It is true that the issues of independent national authorities has been dealt with by the Audiovisual Media Service Directive, and even though they, it's been tried to get the implementation of this independence into that, Anna agrees, I'm sure, unfortunately, this has not happened yet. That's, I have to also um, congratulate the Irish media regulatory authorities, sorry, I'm not using the right term. Um, it was a bit late, but I think they have done a great job and, and, and it's a good example now to show how to also deal with the new challenges but also the, the challenges regarding resources. I've heard that actually you would need much more resources to deal with all these issues. It just shows that it's not only political independence, but the governments have to give the researches needed for the additional work to be done as well. Um, then we also asked for maybe a more specified assessment of public interest tests when it comes to media mergers as a minimum action by the board to include civil society and um, professional organizations in there. This is, in our view, pivotal to fight media capture by media moguls and oligarchs, and also to help the boards and the commission to, to have more enforcement. I get to that later. 
Um, and of course, as I said, the need for enforcement, which probably is the most important point because we feel as the media freedom extends now, as we said, it's very much based on principles. The board in the end has no big role. So that's why we also don't understand all the fuss around it. Um, so the question is, how can we make sure that existing EU um, legislation and what's supposed to be regulated through the MFR can be better enforced? Just to give you a few frustrations from the work up to now, because we really hoped that with the help of the co-legislators, the, uh, the European Parliament on the one hand and the Council of Ministers on the other hand, we would be able to improve the draft. There has been a first um, compromise text now out by the Council of Ministers, which is supposed to be decided upon next week. They are very ambitious. They would like to get something seriously done by under the Swedish presidency, knowing that time is not on our sides. We all would like to get this act to be adopted prior to the next European Parliament elections. I don't think I have to say why. Unfortunately, this Article 4 I mentioned before, which is so important for us on protection of sources, has been considerably watered down, specifically due to a, a non-paper which had been proposed by the French government, I think Macron is behind it, to put national security above media freedom above protection of sources. And that for us is, is a big blow. It's a really, really big blow. And we will, we already wrote the press release, but we will come out on Monday with a letter by many, many civil society groups, digital rights groups, media freedom organizations, all members of the EFJ saying to the ministers, you cannot say you are defending press freedom and at the same time showing that national security is more important. We understand national security is important specifically today, but we have to keep it very precise and, and put it in our view, media freedom above on this very issue and stand specifically in line with the Court of Justice of the European Union, which has been very clear that the mere purpose of safeguarding national security cannot render EU law inapplicable and does not exempt member states from their obligations to comply with the rule of law. If we lose that, I think we lose it all. <laughs> um, sorry for being so bland, but um, I think it's, it's very important. On the other side, more from the um, European Parliament, we have been concerned that Article 6, which, as we said before, 6.1 deals with transparency and 6.2 deals with internal press freedom, with editorial um, independence in that way more from the owners or from advertisers, which, as we have seen through a lot of research and interviews with journalists, is something on the rise and self-censorship has been the response by many journalists. And it's not only in those countries where we have media capture, where we have oligarchs and politicians doing media only for their own interest. It, it, it also happens in Germany and in other countries. And for that reason, we find we really need binding rules that, that protect journalists um, and specifically that gives editors in chief the strengths as the first journalist protecting their stuff and protecting the independence of their content. And here we are a bit concerned that the rapporteur of um, German rapporteur of the European Parliament has been very much influenced by some certain publishers. Um, and what we have there now is makes it completely useless. She adds liability clause, she adds um, the, the overrolling editorial line. With that, many of our members now already say, well, why then having a European Media Freedom Act? So um, that is a big challenge. Um, there is a lot more to say, but I don't want to go into details of all. I think it's also difficult to follow special, specifically for those who don't know it. 
very often when we talk to journalists and ask them, why don't you write about it? They say, well, it's so complex. It takes so much time. We don't have it. And that's one reason why there's not enough, in my view, um, news about this very important development, which is actually of concern to all the journalists they should be writing about. Um, Anna mentioned Article 17 on content moderation, which indeed is probably the most disputed article. Um, we think it's too much there. It is important, absolutely. For us, it's not the most important one, but what we have there at the moment, both in the Council and in, um, in the Parliament, is not so bad. There are still challenges. We can discuss it later. I, I don't want to go too much into the details now, but as it's rightly said, illegal content is being dealt with the DSA, and it's very important to be complementary here and, and now we have to see how the DSA is being implemented, how it works, and there are a lot of questions we all don't know. And that's why I think to, to, to write something decent on Article 17 is not an easy one. So to finish, just a few words on enforcement. Um, as I said before, in our view, these proposed tools do not have the potential of making the already existing enforcement tools, specifically regarding the Audiovisual Media Service Directive, more effective. We, and joined by several media experts, argue that the proposed tools fail to effectively improve the already available enforcement. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. And we think that all decisions of the board and the commission should be supported by a wider consensus of experts and stakeholders. It could be yet another high level expert group. It, it would help to create more trust. As we said before, trust is missing. Trust is missing between the different professional groups, between the regulators, between the governments, the commission and all that. And um, to have a more inclusive approach could really help to, to make this very complex EU governance on media policy not only more transparent, but also more efficient. Um, I think that's, that's it for, for the moment. Um, trust, I want to finish it. We need more trust. We need more trust in journalism. We need more trust among institutions. And um, I think I don't give up yet. I still hope we are getting something decent we can all be proud of when we finish it next year. But I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renata. I'm absolutely sure you you haven't given up, but you're, you'll still go on. And thank you for raising that issue about ambition and vision and, and the importance of that. And I think I won't summarize what you said, but I think there's a critical issue here that perhaps we haven't talked about. And that is awareness, that people's awareness of that regulation and acts that are going through Europe are critically important. And that's where the media does have a role to help people understand what the issues are, what's happening. So that's something I took out of what you said, as well as your very clear frustrations on things that needed to be done. But I think, You've made those points very clearly, and thank you very much for that. We're moving back to Dublin, and um, we've had to, both Anna and Renata have given great praise for what's happening here in Ireland, and we have two speakers here who have been actively involved in this. Um, and our first speaker here in, in the IIEA is uh, Dr. Eileen Cullity, who is the assistant professor in the School of Communications in DCU and deputy director of the Institute of Media, Democracy and Society. Eileen coordinates the, the Ireland Hub for Digital Media Observatory, and she's vice chair of the Media Literacy Ireland, a member of the board of management for Europe Training Network, harnessing digital data, technology and journalism. Dr. Uh, Cullity has published widely, is an award-winning researcher. Her research examines disinformation, digital governance, and the media. And her latest book, co-authored with her colleague Jane Souter, is Disinformation and Man Manipulation in Digital Media, 
which is published by Ross Village. So Eileen, over to you and thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, the kind introduction and to the IIEA for the invitation. So at the DCU Fuji Institute, we work on a lot of projects that look at the changing media landscape and the implications of that for democracy. For example, and I had to list them out, we are the Irish representatives for the Media Pluralism Monitor, the Media Ownership Monitor, the Local Media for Democracy Monitor, the European Digital Media Observatory, and the Reuters Digital News Report, among others. And what all of those projects do is they, they put Ireland in a comparative context. And that comparative context can be really interesting because it allows us to get some perspective. So for example, the Reuters Digital News Report, which is funded by uh, Commission Naman, was published yesterday. And it found that people in Ireland are more trusting of news than the EU average. Or the Media Pluralism Monitor that was published last year ranked 32 countries for their risks to media pluralism, and Ireland was the, low, the ninth lowest. So in general, when you look at those comparative perspectives, things in Ireland seem quite favorable. Of course, one of the challenges when you do that comparative work is that we can become very complacent and we can start to take things for granted and assume, well, things are far worse in other countries, so we don't really need to worry about it. In the Media Pluralism Monitor uh, report that came out last year, my colleague, Dr. Roddy Flynn writes, though professional journalism norms generally ensure editorial content is not shaped by commercial or owner influence in Ireland, the absence of overt rules requiring this remains a concern. So in other words, editorial independence has not really been a major issue here because of journalism norms. But if it were to become an issue and in a kind of volatile changing media market, there's no reason to assume that it won't. There has not been any kind of legal framework uh, to support uh, media. And in many ways, that lack of recognition for the importance of editorial independence, for pluralism, for media freedoms generally, it's actually very surprising. Because for those of us uh, who work in media, who teach it, research it, or regulate it, we spend a lot of time talking about the democratic role of journalism and the role of journalism as a fourth estate and about holding power to account. So when you think about it, it's actually quite strange that we haven't got any of that uh, well enshrined or backed up by, by robust legal frameworks. And it's in that context that I think the European Media Freedom Act is really necessary and very welcome. And we should probably have had something like this quite a long time ago because it finally gives that recognition to media as a pillar of democracy and on, might disrupt uh, the kind of media capture that we see in some countries. And then it might also force more complacent above average countries like Ireland to actually start taking that democratic role far more seriously than they have. So I would just like to make a few observations about the act and the maybe specific challenges for uh, Ireland and media. And obviously that the act sits alongside, as Renata mentioned, these, these other big developments like the DSA, the anti-slap directives and the recommendation on the safety of journalists, but allowing all of that. I think, and this picks up a lot on what Renata said there, that there's a major issue at defining public interest media. Because in our digital media landscape, I think that's the, the most essential thing to do because the nature of media is changing. And what we think of, we inherited all these ideas from a historical system that's now being disrupted and changing. We're not entirely certain what the future is going to be. So we really ought to be defining what are the things we really want and value. And the act refers to media service providers, but that's a very, very uh, broad term. And when you consider that the barriers to becoming a media producer to setting up a media outlet have never ever been lower, I think we need to be much clearer about what we want uh, to protect. And Anna mentioned you know, about uh, media that are professional, and reputable, but I mean, those are value judgments. And a lot of people, the idea of who is a professional now is in flux anyway, across a lot of sectors. So I think that's something, I'm not saying that the act, or maybe it should be in the act, I don't know, but I think we need to be much clearer about who is and isn't included there, especially when we're seeing such a rise of opinion-driven websites and social media accounts that claim to be doing journalism, but they're, they're clearly not. And I think that definitional issue is also at the heart of some of the lobbying that's come from the publishing industry, which was a huge part of the DSA and is now following this. Because what needs to be protected is not the publishing industry. I mean, I don't think there's any duty on any of us to care about the future of the publishing industry in itself. What we care about is public interest, journalism, and, and beyond that media that serves, um, if you think of in Ireland, we have our distinct uh, culture and heritage media that serves 
that and acknowledges that that's valuable. Who the specific players are is far less uh, interesting, I think. I think a second uh, big issue is about the funding of public service media, and this is, of course, critical in Ireland. So the Act has specific provisions to ensure editorial uh, independence, and it seems kind of clear that those were designed to target countries where public service media has been captured by political interests. I think in Ireland we've had the, the opposite issue where public service media has not been captured, it's been completely abandoned by political interests. So successive governments have ignored RTE's pleas to reform the license fee. The government ignored its own Future of Media Commission, which gave its main recommendation was to introduce a new funding model, and that recommendation was ignored. So when the um, against that history of neglect, Article 18 of EMFA says that it is necessary to guarantee that public service media providers benefit from sufficient and stable funding to fulfill their mission. And I think for us in Ireland, we need to ensure that that actually is something that the, the government uh, prioritizes and takes seriously. And incidentally, a number of research studies have shown that the countries with stronger public sector media tend to be more resilient to disinformation. So, and as was already mentioned, public service media is under attack uh, everywhere, and we really need to be uh, defending it. I think a third major uh, issue, and particularly here in Ireland, is defamation and the slap cases. So the threat of defamation has always been a massive issue in Ireland because of our very particular defamation laws and the fact that those cases are heard in front of juries. And recently, the journalist Naomi O'Leary compiled a report for the International Press Institute, and she wrote, legal intimidation affects the full range of Irish media, from the smallest shoestring podcasts and magazines to major broadcasters. And the people she interviewed described, you know, suppressing or quelling stories on things like the housing crisis, uh, sport, sexual abuse, and just day-to-day -day politics. So this is obviously a massive, massive problem. Now, the EU anti-slap directive is about cross-border cases rather than domestic cases. So again, we have to look at our own defamation laws, which is currently being debated, and making sure that that is fit for purpose and that does protect uh, media freedom. And then finally, I think there's just the, the fundamental, I hate to absolutely use the phrase, but the elephant in the room, and that is the financing of independent journalism. Like there's no getting around it. We inherited a commercial media system. So leaving aside public service media, we inherited a commercial media system that was based on the fact that there was finite resources, a limited number of media outlets were able to command massive audiences, and base advertising revenues on that and fund things that are very expensive and time consuming and not the most popular, like investigative journalism, that could be funded because there was lots of money to be made on other stuff. That system is broken and it's not coming back. And that's the issue that we need to address. And that's why I think it is crucial to focus on public interest media. Those are the bits we want to see how they can be funded. The other stuff is you know, it's of interest in other ways, but the critical part for democracy is who is funding the public interest uh, media. In the um, introduction to the act, you know, there's references to where, how EU funding could do this. It's obviously not sustainable that the EU could be funding public interest, uh, not also desirable. We see in Ireland with the uh, some of the recommendations coming out of the Future of Media Commission that are now being implemented, look at funding for funding a broader range of public interest media, so not just broadcasting, but also uh, grants for court reporting, grants for Irish language reporting, things like that. I think we need to be much more open about the model we're moving towards to get that type of valuable content done and being upfront about it and how you secure independence in those uh, contexts. So if you move to a grant system where somebody like Kamishun Naman now has to evaluate grants, well, how do we ensure their independence? Um, so I think the Media Freedom Act is very welcome, it's fantastic, but we need to keep zoning in on securing uh, public interest media. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eileen. I think you've made a very clear presentation of the issues here in, in Ireland and that we have to be careful that we're not complacent. And I suppose we've all heard pleas for more funding, but I think the context that you're putting it in and what the Act now is is looking at is absolutely critical in terms of public interest media. So that's very critical and thank you very much for that.
Our next speaker then is uh, Celine Craig, is the Broadcasting Commissioner with Common Naman, who was established last March. Um, and Celine is one of four commissioners. Celine leads the policy and regulatory um, area for broadcasting media and on demand service. Prior to working and to taking up a role as commissioner, uh, you, as you know, Celine was the CEO of Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. With over 30 years experience in the media regulation, she also worked with all of the BAI's predecessors, which I won't go into. Celine has played a senior leadership role in strategic planning for legislative, institutional, structural change in Irish and European media regulation regime. She's one of the four principals involved in the establishment of the Irish Digital Regulatory Group and one of four regulations establishment of the Global Online Safety Regulations Network in 2002. And she's chaired the European platform of regulatory authorities. She's an active participant in a range of national, European and global fora on legislative and uh, regulatory matters in the audiovisual and online safety fields. Celine, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce, and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks indeed to the IAEA for the invitation to um, address this important piece of legislation. Um, I've been asked to give a regulator's uh, perspective on the European Media Freedom Act. And as some of you know, I've been involved in media regulation um, for many years. It, uh, and as a result of that, I suppose at the core of my work has been the pursuit of the objectives of media regulation, which in a nutshell really concern providing diversity of content um, for audiences, um, ensuring plurality um, in relation to uh, in sources of news and, and public information uh, that citizens and audiences need. And the promotion and protection um, of freedom of expression, I think, is also at the core of media regulatory work, um, together with providing a media environment that um, promotes and sustains independent and impartial journalism. They're the core objectives of Irish media regulation, and they have been there since the very um, outset in, in, in embedded in Irish public policy and indeed very much embedded in the remit of the new Commission of Man. Um, for that reason, it mightn't come as any big surprise to, to you um, that I'm a very strong proponent um, of the European Commission's proposal for a regulation on media pluralism and independence. However, just given that uh, Comshoon is a newly established re regulator and is currently defining and elaborating its um, policies and, and uh, objectives, I'm not proposing to get into the weeds um, of the details of the legislative uh, provisions, the M provisions, um, although we are very much engaged in that, uh, particularly with our European colleagues. But what I would like to do is to give a high level um, view from a regulatory perspective of the policy objectives underpinning the proposal, um, as well as an assessment of um, the Irish regulatory environment and our readiness to embrace and indeed um, implement uh, the regulation when it comes into force. Um, probably, as I've been sort of just averring to there, I think the first thing to say is that the important principles that underpin the, the regulation are not new. And um, these principles have always been central uh, to protecting plurality and liberty of expression. But there are very particular um, threats facing Europe, as all of the previous speakers have, have, have alerted us. And, and the, the ever increasing cross-border nature of the provision of media services, the distribution, um, and indeed the, the consumption of media content the principles take on a very added, added significance and importance, uh, I believe, in the, in the digital media age. I think the, the European Union's ambitions to be a strong, free, safe and democratic Europe can only be achieved if we have a strong, free, safe and democratic media environment that promotes and reflects fundamental European values. Um, 
but but as again has been has been said earlier, the European media sphere is under threat. And um, the finding of the European Commission's um, annual rule of law reports um, and the CMPF's media pluralism monitor um, identify many of the associated risks uh, to the, Euro the European media pluralism environment. Um, including not only the, the sustainability challenges that are, are facing some of our traditional news media, but also market concentration issues, editorial interference, and the rising market power of um, a, a few digital intermediaries. Um, all of those threats, in my view, lead very compellingly uh, to the case and the desirability of putting in place a legislative instrument um, at the European level that sets out a common set, set of principles and strengthens and protects media freedom and promotes editorial independence. And importantly, I, I think as well, this piece of legislation is very complementary to the other um, legislative initiatives at the European level um, in relation in, in within the media environment, such as the AVMS and, and, and the DSA, the regulation on the transparency and targeting of political advertising and the European Democracy Action Plan. And um, I'm glad to say that I, I come today with a degree of confidence um, that Ireland's media is in a relatively healthy state, um, and that's not to be in any way um, Pollyanna-ish about, about the, the, the situation. There are many um, challenges facing the Irish media sector, but I think in the big picture of things, it's heartening to note that currently we rank second in the World Press um, Freedom Index. Um, as Eileen has referred to earlier, also um, trust in media in Ireland is, is relatively high, as, as was reported in um, our launch yesterday of the Reuters Digital News Report Ireland for 2023. Reporters Without Borders state that the overall climate for press freedom in Ireland is positive, um, with journalists work able to work freely and without interference, but they do caution that concerns remain. However, and in particular, they flag the future funding of the media, including um, RTE as our public service broadcaster. All of which is to say that we can't be complacent and there is still much to do to ensure an ongoing healthy and sustainable media sector in Ireland in the years ahead. So, so I'd like to maybe take a look at how I believe the regulation will impact Ireland. Um, I don't believe, I, I believe it doesn't present any major concerns or threats. And that's, again, not to recognise some of the issues that have been flagged here today that, that need to be addressed. But, but I think it's important to point out um, that, you know, we come at this from a strong constitutional, le legislative and, and, and regulatory position within which the regulation is going to be given effect. We have an express constitutional uh, provision in relation to liberty of expression, a whole range of legislative instruments um, that have established the new media regulator uh, with which I have the honour of working and with wide ranging powers and functions in respect of broadcasting on demand and online platforms. Um, further legislative provisions and indeed plans are in train uh, to give effect and grant additional powers to the Commission in respect of the DSA and the, the European Media Freedom Act. Um, I, I think as well many of the issues which have been flagged um, can be addressed uh, through the strong media development function that Kamashun Naman has been charged with. It's, it's a core and I, I believe one that people have remarked to me has been a very welcome um, aspect um, of Commissioner Man's role as a regulator, um, which it, many of which the, the, the provisions, uh, many of the, the provisions within the legislation aim to support the sustainability um, of the Irish media, media sector through funding for public interest content, through media literacy, research and, and other development activities. Um, I'd like to focus maybe a little bit on plurality in the Irish media as well, more specifically. Um, and uh, something which is, is quite somewhat unique, I, I, as I understand it, to Ireland. Um, in, in measuring plurality um, for many years, for, really for, for, for the most part, um, other European jurisdictions um, assess uh, the level of plurality within any media context. They assess it in terms of the economic or, or uh, competition framework that operates there. Um, in, in my view, Ireland took a very brave and a very 
really well thought through um, step in the um, amendment of the Competition Act 2002, when in 2014 it introduced um, specific provisions within our media mergers legislation that distinguished the competition issues from the media plurality considerations and accordingly gave different roles uh, to both the competition regulator and the, the, the um, broadcasting regulator at that time. Um, in, in, in providing separate advices in relation to the plurality aspects of reg regulations. And I think that's been quite important. That, 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 that intervention um, combined with other functions that were given to the media regulator, uh, such as, for example, the requirement to undertake periodic research to assess changes in media plurality in the state, and were also very, very far reaching, I, I believe, at the time. Um, plurality considerations also transverse a lot of the other regulatory functions of the media regulator, such as in licensing and, and compliance, media literacy, et cetera, as well. So it wasn't just solely confined or isn't just solely confined to media mer mergers. But I think all of these provisions are consistent uh, with the statutory requirement that the, 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 the media regulator and it comes to man currently to endeavour to ensure a diverse and pluralistic media sector and the promotion and protection of freedom of expression. Um, so, so just moving then on to our maybe an assessment of our, our ready, rev, readiness to, to embrace the, the European Media Freedom Act in a, an Irish re regulatory context, I think that we are well placed, possibly even uniquely placed um, to implement many of the provisions of the regulation. Um, as I said, the, the principles underpinning the proposal are very consistent already um, with public and regulatory policy more generally. Um, not only is there a strong understanding, I think, of, of what the regulation aims to achieve, um, but the context in which the regulation will be introduced is, con is conducive to the, achieve to the achievement of the aims of the, the proposal. Uh, as I'm, I've referred already to the, the strong constitutional and legislative underpinning, there's well-established regulatory practices in place. And as I said, our new statutory regulator charged with protecting media freedom and independence. I, I think there is on a, again, on a positive note, I think there, there is widespread political and public awareness of online harms and the value of trusted uh, of trusted media and, and public interest content more generally. Um, the sustainability of public interest media and the availability and prominence of public service content are reflected across a range of uncommissions, uh, statutory functions and indeed our regulatory activities. Um, areas already that we're already undertaking, such as the regulatory system of oversight of public service media organizations is entirely consistent with the EC's 2009 communication on the application of the state aid rules. Um, again, regulatory policies, practices and uh, uh, rules have already been adopted uh, to promote transparency in the beneficial ownership and control of media services. In uh, and they form a strong basis, I think, upon which we can build out and up from our additional requirements of the legislation. And I, one such example, really, um, in relation to the uh, aim of the, the Media Freedom Act uh, to, to provide greater transmer transparency on media ownership has been in collaboration with our colleagues in DCU, where a, a, a media ownership database has, has already been introduced for a couple of years now. Um, funding schemes, um, as again, as Eileen referred to, for public interest content are in place and plans are in train uh, for new media funds, parts, uh, the objectives of which will include supporting local democracy and courts reporting. We have relevant regulatory and research experience in monitoring, for example, the code of practice on disinformation that I think will come sharply into focus once uh, the regulation is introduced. Um, and um, Anna referred earlier to um, that need to work in a cooperative fashion with other regulators um, in pursuit again of, of some of the particular provisions of the the EMFA, um, I, I think we've, we've had strong basis and indeed were key drivers here in Ireland in developing a memorandum of understanding with, with um, fellow regulators um, that will actually provide a basis. I'm not saying all of this is already in place, but all of these factors, I think, provide a good basis to build up and out from that. So we're not starting from a blank sheet. Um, 
Yes, I think finally, and, and, and by no means least, um, given that Comish Unaman has been designated as the digital services um, coordinator for the purposes of the, the, the DSA, I think we can readily appreciate and work through at a practical level the inter play between the, the proposed um, legal instrument um, and indeed when it comes to applying the provisions of both pieces of legislation. So what might there be left to do for Ireland? Well, look, I, I think as might be apparent from what I'm saying, I, I think we're, we're well placed to give um, fairly ready effect to the provisions um, of the regulation when they're introduced. Um, while I'm not going to say we've already taken a full mapping exercise of existing legislation um, as against the provisions uh, of the, the, the proposed regulation, I, that's normally the function of our colleagues in, in the department, uh, and we're always glad to, to assist in that regard. But if something is not already in train, I imagine that that will be, will be, will be undertaken. But I, I do think that, as I said, we're working off a strong basis. I mean, a couple of thoughts on on a few things that might need might need to be to to be given some greater effect. I think there's some existing regulatory practices. I gave example there of transparency, but some of these might need to be put on a legislative footing. Um, I think while there's well functioning and independent audience measurement system for broadcasting services, there will be a need to expand the principles of some systems, at least to the online space where that might be appropriate. Uh, similarly, for example, the requirement for a measurement system for state advertising. While I'm glad to say no major concerns have, have surfaced to date, in fact, I, I'm not aware of any concerns that have surfaced at all, but a formal and independent system um, for of measurement would, would need to be introduced and, and potentially put on a statutory footing. So that's it really from me. Um, I, I just suppose just to share a few con con concluding thoughts, I think I think the, the regulation that's planned has, has real potential to create a more even regulatory environment within which media services can operate um, across the European Union by harmonising certain elements of what are currently diverging national media pluralism uh, frameworks. It has enormous potential, I believe, to foster and promote an environment that protects editorial freedom and independence, to tackle disinformation in the media, to deal with foreign interference and to ensure the protection of journalists um, and increased transparency in media ownership. Um, the proposal for a greater level of structured coordination between regulators is a welcome one and one that will ultimately help to ensure the achievement of the regulations objectives. And I think as well to address the cross-border nature um, of many of the challenges and threats to media uh, freedom within the European borders. Um, I believe the proposal is consistent with the whole range of other European legislative provisions and proposals that support and protect the media environment. And in an Irish context, I believe they're largely consistent with current media law and practices. Um, as I said, uh, finally, I, I think Ireland is well placed uh, in terms of existing structures, policies and regulatory practices to give effect to the provisions, but that's not in any way to, to uh, sell short some of those areas that we know still need to be addressed. Some of those have been mentioned today, like the Defamation Act, uh, public service funding and public service media, but I think overall I, 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 would, I would have a positive view about our ability to effectively implement the regulation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Celine. I think you made a very good, clear case of where Ireland is and that we are well placed, but look into the future that some of the issues and challenges that are there, as you say, around transparency, a legislative framework, and also indeed the funding issue that it was raised by Eileen, but also by Renata as well, mm -hmm. that I think this is an issue not only in Ireland, but also elsewhere. But we've had four excellent presentations and I think we've got a very good feel for the issues for this act and the whole issue of pluralism and independence but I'd really like to get over to you our audience for questions and what concerns you would have for uh, and issues you can address with our panel so who'd be who would like to raise an issue Seamus yeah Thank you very much for all those addresses. Uh, so my question is, in relation to protecting media content on very large online platforms when it comes to content moderation, I have two questions. So uh, first of all, to what degree is it democratic or fair to give this type of protection to media organizations? 
as to, opposed to a, a broader range of stakeholders, so say NGOs, civil society, researchers, and so on, who can do really valuable work when it comes to public discourse, and who also help to keep media to account and keep helping the media landscape to be healthy. And a second question, building off of that, so I know that we want this protection to apply to reputable and quality media, but one of the big reasons for this act in the first place is the issue of media capture. So we see lots of European countries where governments use friendly businesses to buy up the media landscape, to buy up previously quality, reputable media. And how do we prevent the risk of this protection applying to media that becomes captured, that was previously reputable, and therefore gives a level of protection to this captured media that doesn't apply to other actors, to civil society, who may be challenging these governments and this captured media? Um, yeah, for all the time. Whoever wants to come in on it. Yeah. Would Who'd like to start? Celine, I see you have your hand up there. Yeah. <laughs> and then Renata. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think um, per perhaps taking the, the second question first, um, Seamus, I think, so, sorry, I just need to, 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 to structure my thoughts here. Um, the, 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 sorry, I'm actually losing, I'm, I'm going back to your first question. Would you mind repeating the second question, yeah, please? Sure, go ask. When it comes to giving media organizations a certain level of protection on yeah. very large online platforms, I'm wondering how do we prevent this applying to captured media? So if we have you know quality media organizations that then become captured by a government to say, yeah. what happens? Does this protection apply to them? How do we stop that from happening? What's the right way to deal with that? Yeah. So look, I, I think in a way that the, the, what the Media Freedom Act, it's not going to necessarily solve every problem, but what it, do, it does give very importantly is a minimum set of standards by which uh, states across the European Union will be required to, to, to implement. And I think looking at, for example, um, some of the advisory functions um, of the new, the, the, new, the new European Board for, for, for Media Services, that also gives a basis upon which you have an independent view established of actions that are being taken within the member states and effectively gives the, the basis for calling some of the things that are happening and, and, and a basis for trying to negotiate um, and, and, and change the kinds of practices and the kinds of controls that are in place. So I think you have to look at the whole set of provisions in the round um, that are designed to really change, if you like, the operating environment um, in relation for, for media services, but also the, the actual political environment as well. It, 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 some of these will take time, um, but I think it does give a basis within which, as I said, it gives a basis for a common set of harmonized principles and a basis to ultimately call member states when, when the actual media environment there is completely out of alignment with what are considered good European practices. Renata, thanks very much, Celine. Yes, as I said, this Article 17 is the one which is which gets the main questions, which is understandable, but maybe also a bit frustrating. Um, but your question, of course, are, are the ones that, that concern us all. And I think that show how difficult it is to, to deal with it. First of all, what we said, it cannot be that the big platforms, the big American platforms are the arbitrators of who deserves a privilege. And I do not want to call it exemption because it was supposed, we tried an exemption within the DSA. We were also against it. And now we are dealing with a privilege, which is not the same. But um, if it's up to them upon a self-declaration by media to decide this media is, uh, should get the exemption or not, I think we already have a problem. Because then it is the bigger media who have most resources, write the best self-declaratory statements, and probably the platforms wouldn't have the resources or interest to really check and balance what's written there. The problem is we have different bodies who could potentially do it. There's, there are the national regulatory authorities. Unfortunately, in quite a few countries, they are also captured. They are not independent. So we all know whom they would give this their declaration. We have media councils, press councils, which could do that role. 
again, they only deal in, in the print and not in the broadcasting, and we do not have so many. Um, so it really is a challenge who could do it, or it's the judges, but that also takes time, or we create new uh, independent bodies of media experts who, who deal with that issue. That all is, is, at least to me, not completely clear. Within the EFJ, of course, we would rather have a journalist privilege that would also help not to deal with the big media conglomerates, but really go back to, to trying to protect the, the integrity of professional journalists, even though we know they're also bad actors of journalists, but it really has to be. And this is, of course, according to national law, normally journalists have to abide to press codex, to ethical standards, to professional rules, what, what have you. But in my view, it all shows how, how complicated it is. I do reckon that the problem is there, that many specific public service media, we had it in many countries, content was taken away. And even though it was re-put a little later, it, it, it does, does not help. But I think we also have to discuss with that the whole question of prominence, the whole question of algorithm transparency. I mean, again, it cannot be that it's the platforms who decide what we all read. And this is happening at the moment. And, and um, the DSA has already worked on that in terms of transparency. But I think much more has to be done. Thank you very much, Anna. Would you like to come in? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe just to add, of course, there is an ongoing debate as to the exact conditions and the details you know, under which the self declarations from the media service providers would be accepted. I think that it's also fair to acknowledge that uh, already in the Commission proposal, I think it was very clear uh, that there are additional conditions. That's why I have spoken before about reputable media, because it's in a, it was a kind of a short uh, um, description of the condition of the article. But it is also fair, and this is maybe an answer to your first question, uh, to say that we are introducing certain duties for media service providers in the regulation no which is probably and that was the article that renata a lot insisted on on both the transparency and also the uh, what she called internal editorial freedom obligations that we ex would expect media service providers to put in place so i think that there is a logic uh, um, I'm not disputing that there are important questions beyond media service providers as to how platforms treat content from many other players in the whole ecosystem, but at least there is a very clear logic in the um, uh, in giving these additional privileges because of the role of uh, the so-called professional media content as public good that Renata has been also recalling. Uh, and giving them this privilege treatment for platforms because they are regulated and because they are also getting additional uh, duties under the new regulation that will come into uh, force provided that we will have these new rules in place. So I think that while of course the discussion on the additional qualifications and the system and who should benefit from these privileges will continue and I'm pretty sure that we will come up with a system which will be much more watertight uh, than the original commission proposal. Um, uh, I think that the, 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 the basic premise is correct. And also in these discussions on this additional, uh, additional uh, safeguards as to who qualifies, we should be very careful not to fall into a different trap into, uh, that, that would you know, force us, and we don't know actually who, uh, to decide who the good or reputable media are and which are not. So I think we have to keep the, uh, be very careful about the criteria, you know, that, that they're objective, that they're objective criteria and that we do not, uh, what, do not introduce any sort of, um, uh, how should I put it, uh, judgmental elements into the system. And I think in that respect, the, the regulation itself already referred to very good work that has been done by the Journalistic community itself, no, in trying to uh, put in put in put in place a framework of objective criteria to which uh, professional or reputable uh, media service providers should adhere to. So 
it is not an easy subject, but I think we are trying, you know, to put in place uh, a system uh, that in a way balances out, you know, the different interests at stake. Uh, and uh, we should still not forget that the basic premise here is that what we would like to have in the online environment in Europe is still a media freedom by default. Mm -hmm. No, uh, rather than <laughs> Uh, rather than 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 the letting uh, a very powerful a handful of very powerful companies decide what we should or should not see or uh, read. Thanks very much, Anna. Eileen, you'll have the last word. <laughs> I think your question raises something very interesting, and it comes back to this idea of there's a big difference between saying who should have privilege and which types of content or which pieces of work deserve privilege because they're very valuable and those end up with you know you end up with two different kinds of criterion and because we are in a state of flux in the middle of digital transition we are seeing a lot more people who are not traditional journalists or media workers doing those types of mm -hmm. investigations even within the media sphere there are a whole range of new roles that are not journalists um, but they they have different titles. You know, Storyful here was, was quite a big one. A lot of the people that work at Storyful were not journalists or they didn't study journalism and they do other stuff, but it's part of investigation and it's essential. A lot of uh, think tanks and institutes do, do really great work as well. So I think we need to put emphasis mm -hmm. on the work. But, you know, this act can't address all of these, these massive mm -hmm. issues. So that idea of media freedom by default is a very good basis to start with. But like anything, we just need to be open that, things might change in the future and there has to be uh, flexibility there and we have to not become fixated on yeah, that defining who deserves privilege because the who isn't what's as important. Mm -hmm. Eileen, thank you very much for that. And I think it's a good note to end on. And mm -hmm. um, we're just past our time. Unfortunately, time has gone very quickly. And I'd like to thank our excellent speakers, Anna, Renata, Eileen and, and Celine for your really incisive presentations, ones that set out very clear issues uh, for discussion. Um, perhaps we hadn't as much time for discussion as we would like, and we might come back to this again because I think you've raised very fundamental issues. What's clear is though, the debate is not over, the discussion will go on and there will be robust, I think, Renata, you're nodding your head there, there'll be robust interventions mm -hmm. in certain areas on topics. And I think that's that's very healthy. But I think, Anna, you've summed it up there that freedom by default is what everybody wants mm -hmm. and what we want to look at. And I thought I was particularly interested in that whole idea of more cooperation between regulators, learning from one another, mm -hmm. building on what's good. I think we're all very pleased here to say, to see and I hear you say how good the Irish situation is, uh, but also our Irish contributors here, both Eileen and Celine, say we can't be complacent. We need to not just look at regulation, but with that fundamental principles that we have within our value system are so critical. So thank you very much for that. It was absolutely excellent and very, very interesting. I'd like to thank our audience here for uh, your attendance, for your participation. I hope you'll see you at our next uh, digital group um, fixture on the 28th of June on digital skills, a completely different area, but we'd I'd love to see you there. I'd like to thank our IIEA team, Lorcan Mullally, Sarah Burke, uh, Hannah DC, who's there, um, our facilities people, Tom Breen and Shona Carney, and of course, Seamus Allen, our digital policy researcher. Um, you know, tomorrow is um, uh, Bloom's Day, so I hope we'll all have this good weather since we're here in North Great Georgia Street with the Joyce uh, James Joyce Centre. I hope you'll enjoy that and enjoy the rest of the wonderful weather that we're having here. And we look forward to seeing you again here, either in person or online. And thank you very much. And thank again, very much again to all our presenters. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for the great moderation. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye now. Thank okay. you. Have a good day.